it's really fantastic to see such a full house here and it, it, it warms my heart that it's not just the three of us who are so interested in the energy future of our island and our state, but uh, uh, the number is growing and growing. And it's also truly a sincere pleasure to share this space here with my friend Jay Ignacio, who I've known for a number of years and really do consider a friend. And uh, Henry and I have been crossing paths as well for over 10 years, so it's great to be amongst uh, friends. and. Uh, I wanted to make one small correction to uh, what Jay said uh, regarding 47 percent. Uh, it's my understanding that if you look at the total number of kilowatt hours consumed on this island over the past 12 months or so, or let's take 2014, that that number is actually probably over 50 percent in terms of renewable. Because as Jay was uh, mentioning, these rooftop solar systems that many of us have there's not an easy methodology to figure out exactly how much power they're making and how much power is being produced back or surplus back to the grid. So I really truly find it fantastic and exceptional that Helco has done the job that they have over the years. And I've been a party, uh, both a participant and observer here for the past 15 years. And they, they have truly been phenomenal in terms of what they've been able to do compared to virtually any other utility, not only in the state, but also in the country. So I, I mean that very, very sincerely. I, I wanted to give a, a few words of introduction about who I am, what I'm doing. My grandparents moved to the islands in the 1920s. My grandfather was actually a sugarcane geneticist. And while I wasn't born here, I've, I've had Hawaii in my blood since I was very small. And I had a chance to move here 15 years ago to be a founding member of ProVision Technologies, now ProVision Solar. And we were a wholly a subsidiary of, of HEI. And it's been a truly extraordinary journey for me personally to have seen this incredible transformation to be part of a PV industry here which came out of nowhere essentially and uh, was crawling along, literally crawling from 2000 to 2006, 2007 when PV, solar PV really started to take off in this state and on this island in particular. So I can, I can say with all sincerity that if we didn't have a cooperating, willing to work with us, utility company, you, you, we wouldn't have the kind of progress that we do now. Now, of course, there's a ways to go. Nobody disputes that. The question is, how do we go in the direction we all, most of us seem to agree we want to go, and what's the best way to do that? So that's who I am, and again, it's a real pleasure to be here. So what in the world is this Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative? I got involved with this uh, in January, December, January, and here we're June, and I had no inkling whatsoever, none whatsoever, that I would be sitting here talking to you this evening, five, six months ago. We sought to get a seat at the table in this docket, one of the most important, most complex dockets, like Henry alluded to, that the state PUC has ever, ever seen with a, a whole circus number of interveners. We got our seat at the table. We're now one of the interveners. And our stated goal is to explore the option of the possibility of an energy cooperative here on this island. So next slide, please. We have nine board members, four directors, and five advisory board members. Uh, you may recognize some of the people there, uh, my, uh, who I call my co-conspirator and the president of the H HIEC, Richard Ha, who has been very much involved in agricultural and energy issues here in the island. He's a farmer uh, these past decades. Michelle Galimba in uh, the Kau area, Gerald DeMello going clockwise. Uh, was working for UHH for many years. Noe Kalipi, my good friend, State Senator Russell Ruderman, Eric Weinert, also in the ag business, uh, Wally Ishibashi, Donna Johnson, and myself. So we, we represent, I think, uh, uh, an interesting slices of, uh, of the Big Island community. Next slide. We're an official 5, uh, 421C nonprofit cooperative association 
uh, registered with the state of Hawaii, having been formed by community and business leaders on the island to, as I mentioned before, explore the possibility of promoting a comprehensive approach to develop an integrated renewable and sustainable energy strategy for the Big Island of Hawaii. Next slide. I, I love this slide, and I, I give my thanks to Jay for first exposing it to me. He's been very kind over the years when I've taught my politics of energy course at UH Hilo to give a presentation to my students. And this is one of the slides that he, he used a number of years ago, and I said, Jay, please give me this slide because it's so incredibly representative of how incredibly isolated our island chain is which presents all sorts of, of challenges, not least of which both energy security and food security, because so much of both come from such an incredibly far, far distance. Next slide. And the, the energy game, as I call it, uh, is, is very complicated, and there are many, many players who are playing this game in, the, in our state. Because again, I, I, you know, you can't minimize, you can't maximize enough the impact that energy issues, energy prices have in our state, both for power generation and also for transportation. And I, I'll share with you, I went to one of my very first energy conferences back in 1980, December 1980, at the Sheraton downtown Honolulu. And all the, the usual big shots back then were there. Uh, Senator Star Spark Matsunaga, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, uh, Mayor Frank Fozzi. Uh, I think the governor spoke there as well. And they were talking about the need to make Hawaii more energy independent, more energy secure. And we had all these incredible renewable resources and that we could be a test bed and a, and a showcase for doing all kinds of wonderful things. This was back in 1980. And I went to an energy conference a mile or so down the road in Waikiki this past December, 34 years later, and by golly, they're talking about the same thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a very hot topic and it's a topic that, that we never seem to tire about talking, to tire about talking about. So, there, there are many, many players in this energy game, from agriculture to people who are paying utility bills and, and filling up their, their vehicles at the gas pump, to the electric utilities, the PUC, which is uh, three members, uh, Lorraine Akiba, Randy Awase, and Mike Champley. M many states, including California, will have five or more PUC commissioners. Ours has three. Elected officials, of course. Uh, tourism and industry. We're still incredibly dependent on tourism and probably will be for decades to come. And they're huge energy consumers, the tourist industry. Uh, environmental concerns and, uh, of course, energy providers. Who, who is actually providing this energy to us that we're using uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? This gives also, uh, I think, a very graphic indication of just how vulnerable we are. And starting with the, 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 the pie chart on the right there, transportation, I mean, and unfortunately, there was an effort a number of years ago to try to boost ethanol production in the state in order to make us less dependent on imported fossil fuels. And, and all, the, all of the best of intentions turned out to be a colossal, colossal failure and that there is no ethanol, local ethanol production of any sort really here in the state. So for all intents and purposes, when you look at transportation, we are essentially close to 100% dependent on imported fuels. And that is a really, really, really tough nut to crack. And in the 34 plus years I've been doing this here in the state, there's been very, very little progress. Whereas electricity, and I apologize for my data being a little bit out, outdated there, 2012, uh, we have been making progress in terms of reducing fossil fuel consumption and burning for uh, electricity production. But I think if I'm not mistaken, statewide, what are we, Jay? We're somewhere still 80, 85 percent uh, dependent, I believe, on uh, imported energy for power generation? Less than that. Less than that? 80? No, not, not, so the not percent that low, but it's, it's like uh, 90. Eight, yeah. What's that? Oh, I'm not sure. But we're still. I think, I think it's 16% six, now. 
I got to go back. Okay, so 80, 80 plus percent still depend on, on imported fuels in order for power generation. So we, yes, we've made progress, but we have still have a ways to go. Next, please. So what is this HIEC and what in the world are we trying to do and what are we trying not to do? I'll, I'll speak about both of uh, both, both points. But just to, to give you an idea of what we think are some of the merits that are worth considering for a co-op of this kind is first and foremost, and it, it would be, it makes for an incredible contrast if you look at the possibility of the island's utility, which is approximately 84,000 customers on this island of about 190 plus thousand people. Uh, the utility being essentially controlled by a company based in Juneau Beach, Florida, 4,800 and some odd miles away, versus the possibility of a electric utility that is locally democratically controlled and has control over one of the most important infrastructures on this island, which is the electric grid instead of having the priorities of shareholders and the priorities of a corporation based very, very far away, a co-op would have the advantage of being community-based and community-chosen priorities under the direct control of a democratically elected board. And you don't have to go further than just a few hundred miles away from here to see uh, a co-op in action that has been by most accounts quite successful since 2002 and that's the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. So it's not just speaking in vague abstractions in terms of this is a really great thing, maybe just maybe we hope to be able to pull this off, kind of wishing upon a star, but I mean there is a real world practical example of folks who have been able to make this successful, a successful model for the past 12 to 13 years on, on Kauai. It's always kind of risky to get in the game of promising lower electric costs. Next era is not promising lower electric costs. Anybody who is talking about a co-op cannot promise lower electric costs. But it is possible to make a case for the likelihood of lower electric costs under the possibility of either a big company with a lot of money, as, such as Nextera, or, or a co-op being able to get access to tax-exempt funding at a lower cost than what otherwise a for-profit company would have to be able to, to pay on the open market. So there, there is the possibility and the potential of lower electric costs through a co-op. And if you look again at the example of KIUC, they have made very steady progress over the years to lowering their costs. They used to be the highest in the state, even more so in the Big Island. They no longer have that, that mantle. Next slide, please. Uh, greater overall energy independence. Again, this is not something that I think the co-op could, a co-op could essentially do dramatically better than what Helco has already done because, again, I give a tremendous amount of credit to my Helco friends for having come a long, long ways. And finally, the last bullet point there, I, I can see a, a, an opportunity to develop island-based fuels both for transportation and for power generation. I think this is uh, an area which, uh, which a co-op could be more nimble and more aggressive in pursuing. And again, one of the things that I learned as I was getting into this is that uh, there is this incredible network of co-ops across the U.S. mainland to the tune of over 900 of them. And they, they, they work in a very supportive fashion with each other. I was just overwhelmed in a very positive sense about how much support there is out there. And it's not just little co-ops here and there who are throwing pebbles at the Goliaths of monster utility, investor-owned utility companies, but they, they are a viable a viable alternative to both a uh, municipal utility and investor-owned utility. Next slide, please. So things got rather dramatic in December. Uh, in fact, uh, HEI Chair Connie Lau actually spoke on that very morning at this energy conference I was in. I was attending in Honolulu on that day in December. And little did we in the room know that Connie was, uh, had a pressing engagement back in downtown Honolulu to announce the deal with her counterpart at, at, at uh, Next Year, Jim Robo. So it's, uh, 
I, I can remember sitting in the, in the room uh, on that, that morning and watching everybody just being glued to their smartphones and the buzz in the room as it hit the wires, essentially, that this, that this was going down. And the, the reason I, I put these photos here is because it's kind of easy to think of, in the abstract, you've got this big company, Hawaiian Electric Industries, and it is a big company. It's one of the largest, not the largest company in the state of Hawaii in terms of market cap. And they've been around more in one form or another since the days of King David Kalakaua in 19, 18, excuse me, 1891. But fundamentally, it, it's about people. It's about people. And I wanted to put some faces up there rather than, oh, there's HEI and there's, there's Next Era. I mean, these, these are people who believe in what they're doing and where, as one or more of us may not necessarily agree in what they're doing or want to go in the same direction, they're committed to, to what they want to do in their course of action, and I have the utmost respect for that. For, for Jay and his colleagues, uh, Alan Oshima, a good, really great guy uh, who's president of HECO, Sarah, Sharon Suzuki, who, who is Jay's counterpart at Maui Electric, and then the three utility commissioners, Mike Champley, lives on Maui, Lorraine and Randy, who, uh, who both live on Oahu. Next slide, please. So, what are some of the challenges to such a co-op? Because, I mean, believe me, folks, I'm not into just banging my head against the wall and, and taking on a Don Quixote-like uh, life of, of tilting at windmills and, you know, mixing my metaphors uh, with Cervantes. Uh, but, I mean, I really do see that this is a perhaps once-in-a-lifetime choice that we can perhaps make here on this island. Uh, it's not likely that... Uh, you'd have another opportunity, we'd have another opportunity to go in one of two directions, one of them being Helco, Hiko, and Miko being merged, i.e. taken over by a much larger fish and a much larger company on the mainland versus the possibility of direct ownership and control by the people who actually live here. But there are enormous challenges, not least of which Helco is not for sale. That is a base reality. It's not for sale at now, at least. Uh, the, the applicants, HEI and NextEra, have made abundantly clear that this is a package deal. And neither party can have any discussion whatsoever, formal or, formal or informal, with any other party that seeks to alter the deal. That's all on the 374-page merger agreement. I, I can't say I've read through line by line, but I've gone through it in, in some detail. So Helco is not for sale. And I'm, I'm in, I do not believe that it's possible in any way, shape, or form to try to force Helco or HEI by beating them up to sell us the utility company, darn it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not going to happen that way if it does happen. So that, that remains obviously a challenge. The electric grid is finite. There's only so much you can do with it. And again, Helco has been, Helco, Hiko, Miko have suffered uh, plenty of slings and arrows over the years in terms of the, you guys need to do more. Why are you so obstructionist? You're anti-solar and all sorts of other wild and, uh, and not so polite rhetoric. But the reality is the grid is finite. Today's grid, tomorrow's grid, next month's grid, next year's grid. You cannot have an infinite amount of power feeding into a finite grid. It doesn't work that way. So whether it's Helco, whether it's Nextera, whether it's the co-op, there are still substantial challenges to get to where we want to go. So the question really is, what is the best mix of energy sources for a reliable grid, for a grid that's more renewable, and for electric prices, which we all want to come down. One of the big challenges in terms of bringing down the cost of electricity is that Helco does not generate all its own power, hasn't for many years. There are a number of independent power producers on this island who have entered into long-term contracts with Helco. Some of them are advantageous for consumers, others are not particularly advantageous for consumers. So that is a challenge because Helco does not have complete control over the generation that is being pumped into their transmission and distribution system. And as much as people love, 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 love in my business to talk about energy storage, batteries, it's not going to happen overnight. 
It's not going to happen, happen next week, next month, probably not even next year. Energy storage is a huge part of the equation, but it's not going to happen soon enough, most likely. Next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, what we're trying to do at this point, uh, those of us in the Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative, is to, to get the word out there of who we are, what we're trying to do, education, uh, encourage discussion, and what in the world is Jiminy Cricket doing on that slide? Well, I've always been a big fan of Disney, and especially Jiminy Cricket, and uh, one of the, the beautiful song of his, uh, it was in Pinocchio, wasn't it? Uh, when you wish upon a... Now, I won't sing any more beyond that. But, you know, it's, it's a fantastic song, right? And to some extent, I feel kind of like Jiminy Cricket in terms of wishing upon a star because, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee about any, many things in life other than what was the death, death and taxes, right? But I, I see this as a worthwhile venture to stimulate discussion, to educate people. Again, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, perhaps, to make a substantial change or make a substantial choice between options before us. And it, it's going to be a very, very interesting uh, next handful of months and next year in terms of how this, uh, this docket is going to, to play out. So uh, it's been great being able to speak to you, and, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you.